As town moderator of the town of Arlington, I call to order the opening night of Arlington's 2023 October special town meeting. And I sincerely hope that this town meeting finishes in October. As I announced previously through the TMM email list, Article 12, the MBTA community's overlay district, with, with the meeting's permission, is expected to be taken up no sooner than next Monday, October 23rd. The intention is to give everyone time to prepare for that article and the multiple amendments that are incoming. If you're a town meeting member, you should have received a message from me sent through the town clerk's office by email about registering in advance to speak or ask questions about Article 12. This is optional, it's not required. Just to be clear, I will be managing two speaker queues during debate on that one article. A live speaker queue like we've used before and a queue for requests made in advance. Uh, I will recognize speakers from both queues in order to ensure that a diversity of viewpoints and questions are presented to the meeting. I will not be publishing a specific algorithm on how the determination of the multiple speaker queues will be managed. <laughs> so please don't ask. Before we begin, I want to take a moment, uh, a more serious moment, to recognize the active war zones in Europe and the Middle East that are at a scale the world hasn't seen for decades. Uh, let's observe now a moment of silence for the victims of these wars and all who are affected. As we reflect on world events, let's remember the importance of what we do here in this chamber. Yes, we deliberate appropriations and bylaw amendments and resolutions, but there's more that we do here. We are living and breathing, we are, we are a living and breathing institution of deliberative democracy for the town of Arlington. Institutions like this one allow members of our communities to resolve their differences on important issues that affect the town peacefully and thoughtfully. And that is a tremendous responsibility and privilege that we all share. As we take up the meeting's business, let us take that responsibility with the seriousness and thoughtfulness that it deserves. There will be times for lighthearted moments, but let us never lose sight of the importance of what we do here together. Uh, I'll now ask the uh, Madam Clerk uh, if there is anyone to uh, swear in for tonight. They are sworn in, thank you. Let us now bring up a vote to consent to the satellite room. This is the same language that we used in the spring annual town meeting uh, since that was the first time we were doing something a little different. This is the same as we did in the spring. So actually, could we switch over to the vote language so, um, so, we know, so everyone knows what's being voted on? Okay, so I will read it since the text is a little small. That duly elected representative town meeting members of the town of Arlington hereby consent and agree to conduct this meeting and address all articles on the warrant by in-person participation utilizing the town hall auditorium and a satellite room in the town hall annex, uh, complex via live audio and video. Uh, so let's, uh, actually before we take the vote, let's take a test vote first to, to work out any kinks that we might have in the voting. There's always like one or two handsets that have an issue. So if we can switch over to the test vote first and then we'll take the vote on uh, consenting to the use of the satellite room. Okay, we're bringing that up, the test vote up right now. Okay, vote yes if you want to finish by Halloween. Uh, yeah, press one for yes. Uh, voting is now open. The green light indicates that voting is open. Vote one for yes on your handset, two for no, three to abstain. Okay, so let's get our test votes in. This is important to make sure that your handset is actually working for 
voting. Uh, let's see, voting is now closed. Let's bring up the votes. Uh, and the motion carries 173 in the affirmative, so we have to finish by Halloween now. Um, That's something else, and we're not going there. Okay. This is how democracy should be done. Yeah, let's, thank you. Can we bring up the, the votes so everyone can confirm that their vote was registered? Okay, so if you see a discrepancy between what you thought you clicked on your handset and what you're seeing on the screen, please, uh, you can bring your handset over to the folks over at the side table. Uh, if you're in the satellite room, you can shout out over the microphone um, and we can send someone up to, uh, to check that out. Also, just a note to the folks uh, in the satellite room, uh, I was informed earlier tonight that you can expect a delay of maybe, uh, maybe a couple of seconds between when you, uh, uh, press a button on the handset and when it actually reports on the, on the digital text display uh, that your vote has registered because there's an extra relay that those votes have to go through to get to the main hall. Uh, and so the folks in the main hall usually will not see a delay like that, but the folks in the satellite room, satellite room might. So if you see that, that's probably what's happening. So please be patient with that. Okay, we're done? Okay. All right, let's now uh, bring up the... Um, uh, let's see, we had the, so now we're back to the vote to consent to the satellite room. This is just asking the meeting's permission. It's not, uh, I don't believe that it's legally required or technically required. It's just uh, to make sure that everyone's comfortable with this. Uh, so, okay, let's, uh, so yeah, I think we're, we're handling a technical issue with a handset, it looks like. So let's get those resolved. And then after that, we'll return to the uh, vote to consent to the satellite room. And I'll, I'll read the text uh, again, uh, if we're not able to switch over. Uh, and the vote is that we'll be taking up in a moment that duly elected representative town, meters, town meeting members of the town of Arlington hereby consent and agree to conduct this meeting and address all articles on the warrant by in-person participation Using, utilizing the town hall auditorium and a satellite room in the town hall complex via live audio and video. And so after we're done handling some uh, technical issues with the handsets, we'll move on to voting on, uh, on that consent statement. Yeah, I mean, and, and yeah, that, that's a good point. We could just take that by, are, are we ready to go? Do we have other issues there or can we? We're good? Okay, let's just switch over yeah, uh, to take a vote on that. So voting is not yet open. You have to wait for the green light. Okay, so green light is on, voting is open. If you consent to the use of the satellite room, which is up in the second floor town hall annex, vote one for yes. Uh, vote two for no if you are not comfortable with authorizing the use of that room. And th or three to abstain. Okay, just uh, voting will be open for just a few more seconds. Okay, voting is closed. Let's bring up the vote. 184 in the affirmative, two in the negative, three abstentions, and uh, so the meeting overall consents. Okay, we'll run through these votes. Okay, we're on the last screen. Okay, so we're, we're done with the, the electronic votes. Um, let's now um, uh, rise for the uh, uh, 
performance of the Star Spangled Banner by Mr. Helmet. Thank you, Mr. Helmet. I now recognize the, the chair of the select board who is coming down from the piano. You gotta do everything around here. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. It is requested, uh, Eric Helmet, chair of the select board. It is requested that members of the select board and elected officials of the town, town manager, department heads of the town and staff, superintendent of schools and staff, committees, commissions, and boards of the town, Minutemen Regional Vocational Technical School District Committee and Superintendent, members of the general court representing Arlington, members of the Arlington Retirement Board, employees and volunteers supporting electronic voting, and also any consultants who have been retained to work for the town relative to articles to be acted on by this meeting and representatives of this news media, be permitted to sit within the town meeting enclosure. Okay, we have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? It, it is unanimous. Uh, constables return. Madam Clerk, do you have reason to believe that this meeting was the appropriately called by the select board and that the constable made a return of service on the warrant in accordance with the laws? Mr. Helmuth. It is moved that if all the business of the meeting is set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Thursday, October 19th, 2023 at 8 p.m. We have a second. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Uh, it carries. We're coming back Thursday. I now call for announcements and resolutions. Seeing none, uh, Article 1 is now before us. We'll receive the reports of the committees. Do we have any reports that are ready to be received? Uh, Ms. Deschel? Maybe. Christine uh, Deschler, Chair of the Arlington Finance Committee. I uh, uh, move that the report of the Arlington Finance Committee and the supplemental report of the Arlington Finance Committee be received. Okay, we have a second. All those in favor of receiving the report of the Finance Committee and the supplemental report of the Finance Committee, the one-pager that was in the back, uh, say yes. yes. All, all those opposed? It is unanimous. Um, Mr. Revlock? Good evening, Mr. Moderator. Steve Revelak, member of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. On behalf of the board, I respectfully submit that the report of the Development Redevelopment Board and its supplement be received. We have a second. All those in favor? All those opposed? It is unanimous.
Okay, uh, Mr. Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, Mr. Moderator Eric Helmuth, Chair of the Select Board. I remove that the report of the Select Board be received. We have a second. All those in favor of receiving the report of the Select Board say yes. yes. All those opposed? It is unanimous. Ms. Deschler. Christine Deschler, Chair of the Arlington Finance Committee. Mr. Moderator, I move that the recommended votes contained in the respective reports of the Finance Committee, the Select Board, the Redevelopment Board be before the meeting without further motion. Okay. We have a second. All those in favor of receiving the, the recommended votes uh, contained in these reports or any other supplemental reports that the receiving, meeting receives in the future implicitly um, uh, say yes. yes. All those opposed? It is unanimous. Thank you. Ms. Deschler? I move that Article 1 be laid upon the table. Okay. okay, we have a second to lay Article 1 upon the table so we can come back to, for further reports or supplemental reports in the future if needed. Uh, all those, uh, and we have a second. Uh, so all those in favor of laying Article 1 upon the table say yes. yes. All those opposed? It is unanimous. Article 1 is laid upon the table. That brings us to Article 2. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, again, Christine Deschler, Chair of the Arlington Finance Committee. Since our original Finance Committee report um, was issued, it has come to the attention of the Finance Committee that due to the language of the override ballot, the appropriation being sought in Article 2 cannot be achieved through funding um, through the override. Uh, specifically, the, the ballot as written is not effective until FY25, and Article 2 sought funding for this, additional funding for the schools for FY24. Accordingly, the Finance Committee voted to recommend a no action vote on Article 2. Um, I would like to defer to the town manager as to any more, uh, as to questions regarding any more details about the override ballot and perhaps the chair of the select board would like to make a few comments, but uh, Mr. Moderator, as this is a no action vote, it is obviously up to you to determine whether you will entertain for the discussion on this article. Great, thank you, Ms. Deschler. So just give me a second here. So the, uh, the supplemental report from the Finance Committee, which just came out tonight, moments before the meeting, uh, uh, has a recommended vote, now, an updated recommended vote of no action to be taken under the article. That would typically mean that we have, there, there's no scope for debate. I think under the, circum the, the extraordinary circumstances, I think uh, uh, I'm open to the meeting being informed about how we got here since this is kind of exceptional. Mr. Helmuth, did you want to explain to the meeting? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Eric Helmuth, Chair of the Select Board. Uh, the following remarks uh, were uh, authorized by, uh, this, by my colleague on the Select Board uh, to represent them this evening. Um, earlier this month, a typographical error was discovered uh, on the ballot language for question one of, uh, on November 7th that's prepared under the direction of the previous town manager and voted by the select board. Specifically, instead of specifying July 1st, 2023 to identify the fiscal year in which the override would take effect, it said 2024. As a result, the tax increase, if approved by voters on November 7th, will take effect next July and on the August tax bills and not in February and, and uh, spring of next year as originally planned. It also means that the town will ask voters for $7 million less through, S through FY26 than originally planned. When the error was discovered, the board had two options, to change the language and delay the election, or proceed with the current language. After consulting with the town manager and his finance team, it became clear that we could proceed as is and still meet all the select board commitments to taxpayers for this override, maintaining services, through FY26, making specific new investments, and not asking for another override before fiscal year 27 because we will still have a balanced budget through fiscal year 26. Now this course of action was made possible by two things. First, some very recent positive, though very likely one-time financial developments that the town manager will shortly detail. And it was also made possible because of the town's conservative budgeting practices that are designed to withstand unexpected events. 
although it is clear that the town very much needs the override funds starting in FY25. I am pleased to report on the behalf of the select board that we are very comfortable with this course of action that is good news for taxpayer wallets, but remains a responsible financial approach that protects the town's ability to continue providing outstanding town and school services to our residents into the future. And for some additional remarks, I'll turn to, with the moderator's uh, permission, to the town manager. Uh, Mr. Feeney, do you have more to add? About, and again, let's keep this to the, since it, there's no scope for debate under a recommended vote of no action that we have in front of us, uh, just to keep the, the remarks uh, limited, please, to let's just, how, how we got here to this extraordinary uh, circumstance. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jim Feeney, town manager. Good evening, town meeting. So as the select board chair referenced, working with the finance team, we were able to update our financial plan based on the most recent information available and we determined that we would in fact be in a position to meet the stated commitments for fiscal years 24 through 26 within the confines of an override that did not take effect until next year. At this time of year, as many of you know, important figures come into focus for municipal finance. This includes our assessor's office honing in on our new growth, which exceeded our estimate. We also learn about school enrollment, which is still growing but to a lesser extent than was conservatively and prudently forecasted. And we also have our free cash certified by the Department of Revenue. The town's free cash position was particularly strong. Of course, we had a milder winter than normal, but we also benefited from other favorable, perhaps temporary, economic circumstances outside of our control. Namely, ever-increasing interest rates yielded significant returns on our sizable interest-bearing accounts. And the tight labor market resulted in delays filling many open positions, which ultimately results in a salary surplus. So given the circumstances, we were able to balance the long-range plan through fiscal year 26, of course, should the ballot uh, question pass on November 7th. And of course, this would also defer consideration of a school department budget adjustment originally contemplated by Article 2 until the spring town meeting, when, again, we will be further along in the fiscal year. Thank you. All right, thank you. So uh, we have several speakers in the queue, but there is no scope for debate. Um, it would be an appropriate time. I don't want to encourage it, but it would be an appropriate time for points of order under the circumstances. Um, but I'm not, I'm not opening the speaker queue, given that the main motion as it stands right now is no action. So there's, there's nothing to debate. Uh, but if there's any confusion that might be clarified by a point of order, I would, be, I would be willing to entertain that for a limited period of time. Mr. Jameson, do you have a point of order? How we get what? Ah, yes, I can do, I can do that. Um, so when we do open the speaker queue for an article that has a recommended vote of something, um, uh, I will try to remember to uh, notify the folks uh, managing uh, the speaker queue on the side, or the displays, uh, to switch over to the speaker queue uh, uh, ahead of the introduction of the article uh, so folks can see when it opens, so they can see if they've gotten into that initial tranche of requests on the queue. Um, we won't be going back to it constantly because there might be other things that we want to display, like the text of vote language, for instance. Um, but initially, I think, uh, because there's a confusion about when the queue opens and whether you got in or not, uh, we'll try to remember to have that up and displayed on the main display uh, before we introduce the article. Uh, and then once we go into a presentation, we can switch over to like the, uh, a slide deck. Okay? Mr. Jameson? I believe the button, can someone confirm on the side? The button. Uh, oh, that's different from last time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one to get on the queue, two to get off. Is that correct? Yeah, look, can, can, we, can we do a trial run of that just to verify so there's no confusion? Um, so can we clear the queue now and show it and so we can actually have like cold hard evidence of how this works. Can we switch over to the speaker queue on the main display? Okay. And oh, 
now we're scrolled off the bottom, so. Okay. All right, so can we clear the queue and can I ask the folks refrain from hitting the buttons on their handsets? Uh, Mr. Point, Mr. Of Wagner, order. point of order? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Moderator, Carl Wagner, Precinct 15. Yeah. I believe other buttons also add people. I pressed 9, the old button, and it worked fine, I believe. Could you confirm yeah. that, that I'm on the queue after N pressing 9? My button? understanding last time was that, that pretty much any button would have oh. gotten you onto or off of the queue, but uh, is that what you're seeing now? I think I saw my name and I pressed 9 only, so just okay. in case people want to do that. Okay. I, I think it works. Okay, so let, this will take a lot of self control. Everyone, please don't push buttons on your handset right now we, and, so we can get through this quickly. Um, Joe, can, can, can you reset the queue and uh, the speaker queue and show it? And then I'll ask folks in the front row in the auditorium only to try hitting various different buttons and to verify what gets you onto or off of the queue. Does it appear to be the case that hitting any buttons toggles you onto or off of the queue? Yes. That is correct, okay. That is empirically what we believe to be going on. Uh, okay. Arguably still better than just people raising hands, but um, yeah, we have a point of order. If you hit one and you see your name on the queue, my understanding is that at least in the main hall, we're all like uh, in here, that it's it's within probably a second or so that it should appear. Like there's a very s small delay for it to get processed through the system, so I wouldn't hit it like within a second because you might. Yes, if you hit it an even number of times after the queue's been open, you will be off the queue. You'll see, uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Slickman. You, you will see the confirmation on your screen whether the request has been processed. Just like with voting. Um, yeah. Okay, so yeah, there, there might be multiple seconds of lag. So wait for what, look, look for the, this, that, that little digital text display on the handset. A, like, look for the, the, um, the confirmation that it's received your, uh, your click. Uh, it'll say on the text display, I don't have a handset, but like, it'll say added to queue or removed from queue. So await the confirmation text on the handset. Um, and hopefully in the future we have a, a better system for doing this, but this is what we're using for the time being. Okay, with that cleared up, I believe we still have Article 2 before us. Yeah, Mr. Kepline, you have a point of order? Can you go to the microphone so everyone can hear you? Yeah. Mark Kepline, Precinct 9. Mr. Moderator, uh, we have an important vote coming up next month on the tax override. And so far, I've not seen. Well, we have, he hasn't finished the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> not seen specific information for voters to decide upon on this issue, important issue. And, you know, this article, too, would be an opportunity to do some fact finding for the voters. Well, let's, uh, let's bring up the article text for article two, at least with the schools, which. Is, uh, is being said to be the primary driver of the override. Right, and so if you bring up the text, right, to see if the town will vote to appropriate or transfer a sum of $400,000 from the tax levy for the fiscal year 2024, Arlington Public Schools operating budget, and so on and so on. Um, but my understanding based on the explanations by Ms. Deschler, Mr. Helmet, and Mr. Feeney is uh, that there's nothing to do under this article because of the year. Okay. If the year were 2025, then it would be a different situation. Where did the 400,000 come from? 
there's, there's no act, there's, there's, there's nothing. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, the voters would appreciate more information from everyone. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay, so we have a, vote, a recommended vote from the Finance Committee from the Supplemental Report uh, of No Action on Article 2. We'll take that by voice vote, since there's nothing to do under this article. All those in favor of no action, say yes. Yes. All those opposed, say no. Uh, it is unanimous. We will do nothing. Uh, that takes us to Article 3. Um, let's see, is... is Director Ricker here to introduce us. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. My name is Claire Ricker. I am your Director of Planning and Community Development for the Town of Arlington. Of Arlington's 2,558 uh, acres of zoned parcels, only 3.7% are within the business districts. This 3.7% of zoned land when combined with the small... Oh, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. I've paused your speaking time. Can we bring up the speaker queue and open it so everyone can see? I'm so sorry for the interruption. That's okay. This 3.7% okay. of zone... I'm sorry, is the speaker queue open? It's open now. Okay. And did you want your slides, Ms. Ricker? Um, did you want slides? Sure, yeah. we could put up the slide for Article Here are the slides for Article 2. Thank you. Sorry about that. Great. I'm sorry, Article 3. Thank you. All right. We're going to skip ahead. In late 2022, the Arlington Redevelopment Board discussed a number of amendments to encourage commercial development and attract new commercial uses to the business districts B1 through B5, while supporting additional town goals for sustainability, urban design, and overall site standards. One method for doing this is to thoughtfully evaluate dimensional requirements and controls in the zoning bylaw to effectively support development opportunities efficiently use limited land resources, and increase the diversity of business types in town. Warrant Articles 5 through 9 and 11 seek to encourage redevelopment in the business districts to meet Arlington's economic development and sustainability goals. And now on behalf of the Department of Planning and Community Development, I'd like to introduce Redevelopment Board and Town Meeting Member Steve Revelak to present on Zoning Warrant Articles 5 through 9 and 11 pertaining to business districts, Article 10, pertaining to expansion of the town street policy, Article 3, which you see right now, is an administrative correction to the zoning bylaw. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Mr. Revelak, do you have more to present? Not much. Okay. <laughs> well, you have five minutes to do it. Okay, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Steve Revelak, member of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. Uh, so Article 3 proposes an administrative correction only to correct a reference in the zoning bylaws to a re-lettered subsection of Section 813. Uh, Section 813 was amended at the 2022 town meeting. Uh, this amendment provides clarity to the zoning bylaw and does not alter its substance. The ARB voted 4 to 0 at their October 2nd meeting to recommend favorable action on Article 3. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, seeing no one in the speaker queue, we can go straight, and there are no amendments, let's go straight to uh, a vote on Article 3. And so while we're bringing that up, before we open up the voting, I, I'll just uh, summarize. Uh, this is Article 3, vote yes to make an administ administrative corrections to update references in the zoning bylaw, section 5.9.2, that were previously amended by town meeting in spring of 2021. If you're in favor of those changes, you'd vote yes. If you're opposed, vote two. Hmm? And this, this is, yes, thank you, this is a uh, majority vote. Point of order. Point of order, Mr. Wagner. Excuse me, Mr. Moderator, Carl Wagner, Precinct 15. Is, is abstain no longer an option? Three? Oh, you can still uh, you press mention, three. You okay. did not mention that. Thing. Okay, sorry. You can press three uh, or do nothing to abstain. Okay. It counts the same. Okay. Voting is closed. 197 in the affirmative, one in the negative. Uh, it passes. That brings us to Article 4. Uh, we can go straight to Mr. Revelak, unless uh, Director Ricker has anything to introduce. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Steve Rebelak, member of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. Uh, so the Redevelopment Board voted uh, four to zero at their October 2nd meeting to recommend no action be taken on Article 4. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a recommended vote of no action. Uh, that, of course, means that um, there's nothing to debate. There's no scope for debate. And, see, and there's been no substitute motions offered uh, in advance. Uh, so uh, we can go straight to voting. So let's open up voting on Article 4, which has a recommended vote of no action. And that's all there really is to say about it. Did we, was, I heard some murmurings. Was, was there a point of order or are we good? Okay. Uh, Ms. Crowder? Uh, that is not in the scope of no action. The finding that led to the recommended vote of no action? Uh, I think we just have to take our own interpretation of that at this point. So voting is that we have uh, 12 seconds. Long. We, we can hold voting open a little bit longer since uh, we had interrupting, interrupted voting. This is a, a vote of no action. Vote one for yes, for no action. Vote two for no, which still does nothing. Or you can abstain with three. OK, so let's close voting now. And uh, the motion carries. Uh, let's see, 188 in the affirmative, three in the negative. Uh, we will take no action. That brings us to Article 5. Mr. Revelak, are you, are you presenting on this? Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, Steve Revelock, member of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. I'd like to request that the submitted slides related to Article 5 be shared at this time. Okay, and actually while we're waiting for that, can we, did we already reset the speaker queue or can, can we show and reset the speaker queue so everyone can see whether they're getting on? Okay, speaker queue is now open. <clears throat> Okay, so thank you. I will be taking you through Warrant Article 5. It is a proposed zoning bylaw amendment re related to open space in the business districts. Uh, but first, I'd like to start Let's with some over. context. Uh, next slide, please. Let's switch over to the slides. Here, thank you. Ah, yes. So with the exception of Article 10, Articles 5 to 11 are being proposed as a package uh, to enhance Arlington's business districts. These were inspired by the 2022 town meeting changes to the floor area ratio to encourage the redevelopment of underutilized properties in the business districts. So currently, Arlington's business districts make up a, a small percentage of all zone parcels in town. So last fall, the Redevelopment Board identified a number of business zoning requirements that inhibit the ability to redevelop properties in the business districts to the heights previously approved by town meeting. At that time, the Redevelopment Board began working on a series of proposed amendments that would address the challenges to creating more needed and desired quality commercial business space in the few areas of town that are zoned for business development. Next slide, please. So what you're looking at is a map um, showing the business and industrial districts. The sort of purple magenta-ish areas are the business districts. Um, this is the only areas, of, these are the only areas affected by these articles. Uh, next slide. So open space is a defined term in Arlington zoning bylaw, and it refers to a private yard or outdoor space. Currently, it can be located on a roof or a balcony no more than 10 feet above the lowest floor used for residential purposes. And the requirements are based on a percentage of the gross floor area, which is basically the square footage of the interior of the building. So open space does not mean public space or green space or pervious space. It only means that it's open. It is a defined term in our bylaw. Next slide. Okay, so Article 5 proposes three main changes. Changing the calculation of open space from being tied to the residential gross floor area to being based on a percentage of lot area. Uh, number two is increasing the amount of landscaped open space required while eliminate the, eliminating the requirement for usable open space in the business districts. And finally, allowing open space on balconies and roofs, but at any level, not limited to 10%. And again, these changes would only apply to properties in the business districts. Uh, next slide. Uh, 
that's it right there. Uh, so to address the first change, open space is currently tied to residential growth floor area as opposed to parcel size, which means that the area of each property that's dedicated to open space increases with the size of the building. For example, if you consider a mixed use building with two stories, the second story of residential creates an open space requirement. Now consider adding a third floor. This doubles the amount of residential space and it doubles the open space requirement. The footprint of the building has to become smaller. So tying the open space to gross floor area tends to limit the footprint of mixed use buildings and the amount of ground floor space available for commercial use. So these limits also restrict uh, building height beyond the limits set forth in the zoning bylaw and the, the ability to develop upper story residential. They typically exceed the rear and side yard setback requirements in most business districts. Uh, next slide, please. So by increasing the required percentage of landscaped open space and eliminating the requirement for usable open space in the business districts, this amendment would align with the strategic goals of the town of Arlington. Currently, our open space requirements do not reflect the environment and climate priorities of the town, as the definition of open space limits where and how its benefits can be achieved. Next slide, please. So currently, balconies and rooftops can only count as open space if they are located not more than 10 feet above the level of the lowest story used for housing. The incorporation of landscaping on balconies and rooftops is an important strategy for the town to embrace, allowing for climate positive impacts while maximizing our ability to create tax revenue generating commercial space. It's important to note that on private property, neither usable open space nor landscaped open space are required to be accessible to the public. They're intended for the occupants and users of the building. Thus, adding landscaped open space where it would be most impactful to the building's occupants and users is a positive outcome of this amendment. Next slide. So this article, Article 5, simplifies and improves usability of the zoning bylaw by tying open space calculations in the business districts to parcel size rather than building size. And although it eliminates the category of usable open space from the dimensional requirements, it increases the requirements for landscaped open space within the town's limited number of business districts. The ARB voted 4-0 to zero at their October 2nd meeting to recommend favorable action on Article 5. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Revelak. I now want to invite uh, Mr. Weinstein up to introduce uh, his amendment. Can we bring up uh, Mr. Weinstein's amendment, please, on the display? Hi, thank you. Uh, Jordan Weinstein, uh, Precinct 21. This is an amendment to Article 5, which uh, just to, uh, to set the stage, uh, I really like what Article 5 is doing to a great extent. I think that it's fantastic that they've changed the, the calculation for how open space in the business district will be computed rather than on uh, floor space to tie it to parcel size. And that from the very beginning is going to increase the footprint of any building if it's tied to parcel size. Um, and you want to diminish open space and have a bigger usable space for commercial property, this is great. This is great. But there is a fatal flaw in this. If you could go to the uh, second slide, and I'll show you what my amendment fixes. Um, this is how open space is defined in our bylaws for any parcel, right? The difference is right now, if with the passage of five, you will get a larger footprint, be allowed to, to build a larger footprint uh, on business parcels. If you go to the next slide. This takes it a step further though. It inserts these two sentences that basically say, ex these definitions apply except in the business district. So it's removing all the definitions for open space on any property in the business district, which is already getting a bonus of more footprint on the parcel because the definition of how you calculate open space will change. So I'm saying this is double dipping. And what we should do is vote in favor of my amendment, which would take out these uh, phrases, these two phrases, that would simply restore the definition of open space for business. 
albeit with the enhancement that it's already going to be provided for by a different a change in how it's calculated. So I would say I'm I'm uh, if you can go to the last slide or the next slide <clears throat> and the next one. Yeah. Um, Basically, the amendment would eliminate the uh, recommendation that the open space definitions be taken out, um, leave the existing definitions unchanged, and require that landscaped and usable open space be at ground level, or as uh, Steve said, slightly above, uh, in buildings in the residential, uh, I mean, in uh, business districts. So please vote in favor of uh, this amendment to Article 5, and then yes on 5. Thank you, Mr. Weinstein. Uh and just to uh, make sure we're all on the same page about what we're discussing, uh, can we bring up the, um, let's see, the article uh, within the annotated warrant? And that, that way we can see those, because I know that was kind of hard to read. Uh, some of that, that text was really small, so I hope this is a little bit bigger. All right, thank you, so we have the vote language here that we have up on the display. And so if we scroll down slowly, you'll see the underlined section that was highlighted in Mr. Weinstein's uh, presentation, the except in the business districts where open space, so on and so forth, and then the other section. So these definitions in section two of the zoning bylaw, according to Mr. Weinstein's amendment, would be left intact. Um, but the other changes, the other uh, uh, changes in the zoning bylaw proposed by the main motion, the recommended vote from the ARB, would be retained with Mr. Weinstein's amendment. So with that, let's uh, go to the speaker queue. Let's take uh, uh, Mr. Owen from the balcony. Hi, Matt Owen, Precinct 19. Um, so I want to speak in favor of this article. This is actually an article that I, at least in part, suggested to the ARB at an ARB meeting last year. I'm not aware that this was sort of already in the pipeline to be worked on um, originally for Springtown meeting. And the reason I recommended it was just attending various ARB meetings and seeing um, dockets with, with this mixed use redevelopment, it became very clear that the, the bylaw as written was more or less unworkable for um, doing the type of mixed use development that um, I think our mixed use bylaw um, should want to allow, and that's essentially because, as Steve explained, there's, um, when you have this open space scaling with the size, you very rapidly sort of lose building space and thus lose commercial space versus what previously exists on the lot, and you don't actually get a lot of um, additional residential space um, sort of in exchange for that. So I'm, I'm very much in favor of keeping as much commercial as we can, but also adding much needed housing to our business districts. Um, I am not, I don't understand all of the portions of Mr. Weinstein's amendment. Um, I do know it sort of seeks to um, require that the 15% landscape open space um, be completely at ground level or only 10 feet above. I think that may not be necessary, and the reason for that is that the lots that are generally being redeveloped for the mixed use tend to be on the sort of larger business lots, and the pre-existing conditions on those lots is more or less 0% open space. It is a commercial building with parking and a dumpster, and that's pretty much it. So I could see if there was sort of a large pre-existing open space, a desire to sort of add, um, to retain sort of ground floor open space, but I think allowing it on upper floors really allows us to sort of get the redevelopment and get you know some, some green space sort of present in the business districts without having to sort of cannibalize business space for parking or any other. I encourage a positive vote on this. Thank you. Thank you. And one thing I forgot to do, Mr. Weinstein, uh, I can invite, actually, Ms. Ms. Malopchuk, uh, can I hazard a guess that you'll be supportive of Mr. Weinstein's amendment? That will not affect your order of speaking. Uh, I now recognize you to speak, and can uh, you can come on your way up, and 
Uh, I forgot to ask Mr. Weinstein to move his amendment. Uh, uh, so, but, uh, Ms. Malofcik, can, she, she can just move it when she gets up to the microphone and save us a little bit of time. Thank you. Apologies for doing that out of order. Beth Malofcik, Precinct 9. Mm -hmm. uh, you can just make a motion to, uh, to move Mr. Weinstein's amendment to the main motion. Motion to move uh, Jordan Weinstein's amendment to the main motion. Okay, we have a second. Um, okay, so it is so moved. Thank you. You can go ahead with your remarks. All right. Um, I find this slightly mystifying. I'm all for um, green space on the ground, and I'd rather like the green space at the Brigham's um, residential building on the bike trail that I believe was formerly a commercial space. So I'm gonna be very brief and say, please support Jordan Weinstein's nuanced amendment that allows the reconfiguration, but preserves the um, protections for green space, which we all benefit from. And an example of that that I just thought of is that Brigham's building on the bike trail where you can see the nice trees and grass and it is one of the developments that actually does embrace the bike trail, which I'd like to see more of, and you'll find that in the standards document from 2015, which I'll be talking about at a later point. But so thank you very much. Please vote for Jordan Weinstein's amendment um, and then uh, for that article. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Malofchak, and apologies to Mr. Weinstein for not introducing that earlier. Uh, Ms. We'll take um, Mick Pretzer from the satellite room. Hi, uh, David Pretzer, Pre-617. Uh, I rise in favor of this article. Um, our, our business district um, are currently often have, they're small parcels. They often have little or no open space to begin with. Um, and the current requirement makes it, you know, is a real barrier in terms of creating taller buildings where one-story buildings currently are. I think mixed-use buildings that have residential and commercial are great use for our business districts. And um, the, the current open space amendment gets in the way of this, and I think the ARB's recommendation is a great way of both recognizing the value of open space, but also allowing taller buildings to be, to be permitted in a way they aren't today, so that we can avoid unnecessary barriers to housing creation. Um, so I also, I, I also would encourage voting against the Weinstein Amendment. Uh, given the limited amount of space in our business and on many of our business district parcels, um, rooftop spaces may be the best place for roof, you know, rooftop gardens. Are there um, green rooftop spaces maybe the best way to get open space while allowing uh, new buildings that could bring, create housing and bring value to the community? I don't think it makes sense to say rooftop gardens are allowed, but only in certain cases based on the height of residential. I think we should allow rooftop gardens in general, and so therefore I say vote against the Weinstein Amendment and vote for the main motion. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take Mr. Jalkut next. Daniel Jalkut, Precinct 6. Um, I am a little confused about what the implications of the Weinstein Amendment would be. So I want to ask some questions. In particular, um, I know the sort of fear was raised that, I think I understood the fear being raised earlier that open space that currently exists might be lost, like ground level open space might be lost. And I'm not sure if that's true. I kind of like the idea. I mean, I actually totally like the idea that existing lots with no ground level open space shouldn't have to create new ground level open space to uh, participate in this. But just as a question, Mr. Moderator, whoever you think might answer it best, would um, the provisions that are being added that were requested to be removed by Mr. Weinstein, would those allow current properties with ground level open space to rebuild without that ground level open space? 
Okay, so I believe the meeting has Mr. Weinstein's opinion on that from your, his presentation. I'll, I'll, I'd like to ask either member of the redevelopment board or the planning department uh, for their opinion on that. Eugene Benson, Precinct 10, and Arlington Redevelopment Board. This article does not reduce the required amount of open space. All this article does is allow the open space to be on a roof above the first floor or on balconies. Some of you may have seen these amazing photos of, of uh, buildings in Europe where there are hanging gardens on the front, this would give um, building owners the opportunity to do that. These are, under our bylaws, open space that are for the use and benefit of the occupants of the building. And this gives us more opportunity for that. And as you know, green roofs are one way Mr. Moderator, that we I feel this deflect is not heat. completely answering. This is kind yeah. of going off, off course from my yeah. question. This is, Mr. So, this is Mr. Jalkett's time, so. Um, I'm sorry. What's so the, just to say, um, it sounds like what you're saying to me right now, and as opposed to clarifying whether or not ground level open space would be allowed to be replaced with higher level open space, it sounds like you're uh, trying to reassure people that oh, higher level open space is good, and that's a separate debate from what I'm asking. What I'm just asking is, will this change, if the amendment is not accepted, would it allow, for example, an existing lot with a good amount of open space on the ground floor to rebuild, eliminate that open space. I'm just, I'm not it, even saying it would, whether it's good or bad. I just want to know, because I don't understand yeah. it from what's been presented. Yeah. It, it would allow them to move some of that open space to balconies and rooftops, green open space to balconies and rooftops. Yes, indeed, it would do that. There does, however, need to be some open space on the, on the ground level. In okay, so suffice to say that the standard applied to an existing property that's redeveloping would be the same as for a new property that was being developed. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Okay, let's take Mr. Newton next. Sanjay Newton, Precinct 10. Uh, I had a question. Um, Today, uh, under our existing bylaw, before we make any changes or think about making any changes tonight, can uh, green or open space be provided on a roof? Under current rules? Under current. Okay, do you have someone from the redevelopment board, Mr. Benson? Yes, Eugene Benson, Precinct 10 and redevelopment board. Yes, it can, and in a new development, they could move that open space to the roof if it's on the first level. On the first level. On the so, first level. so essentially what you're saying can happen today is a green roof can be provided, but can it only be provided on the first floor. So in a mixed use building, they can build commercial on the first floor, and then they ha would have to use their roof space to build open space. Well, they could build well, they commercial, could. commercial on the first Correct. floor, residential on the second. But they would have to take space. away space from their residential to provide that roof-based open space today. It depends on which level they're putting it. But, but today their only option yes, is to put correct. it on the first level. Above residential. Above, Above oh yes, so their second story, right. yes, could be full, and then the third story would have to be much smaller. Correct. So essentially, if we pass Mr. Weinstein's um, uh, amendment, that's less housing in our mixed-use buildings. It could be. Yes. Thank you. I would urge you to vote against the Weinstein Amendment and support the overall article. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take Mr. Granucci next. For a second, I thought that was going to descend into a who's on first bit. Uh, Carmine Granucci, Precinct 21. I move to terminate debate in all matters before it. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate and we have a second. So 
Let's try this by voice vote. All those in favor of terminating debate on all matters under Article 5 say yes. Yes. All those opposed? No. I don't think it carries. Okay, we have two, three, four standing, five standing. So let's, let's take electronic vote on termination of debate. And can we, we can do that without losing the speaker queue, is that correct? Okay. <laughs> okay, waiting for the green light. Okay, voting is open for termination of debate. Vote one for, one, one to terminate debate, two to continue debate, and three to abstain. And this is a two-thirds vote. Okay. I'll take a picture of the speaker queue in case anything catastrophic happens. Okay. Okay, voting is closed, and the motion passes. This is calculated as two-thirds, correct? Yes. Okay, debate is terminated. So we will now go to a vote on Mr. Weinstein's amendment. A point of order, Ms. Dr. Yantar. The well, there's one article under consideration. The main motion uh, is a two-thirds vote. The am amendments are always uh, amendments to main motions are always majority vote. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so. Uh, debate is terminated. Let's go to a vote now on uh, the, uh, uh, Mr. Weinstein's amendment. And, uh, and before we open voting on that, just to uh, as a rem as a reminder, uh, Mr. Weinstein's amendment would strike the changes from the main motion from the ARB, uh, so that it no longer in section two of the zoning bylaw no longer changes the definitions of open space. Right. Okay, so let's bring up a vote on the, the Weinstein Amendment. Okay, so if you are in, the voting is now open. If you're in favor of the Weinstein Amendment to strike the changes to the open space definitions in section two of the zoning bylaw, you can press one for yes to accept that change to drop those uh, changes in definitions of open space. If you want to retain the ARB's recommended vote, which includes changes to the open space definitions in section two of the zoning bylaw, then you would vote two for no to reject the amendment to the main motion. We're just voting on the amendment to the main motion. Okay. Okay, voting is now closed. This is a majority vote and it, and it fails. So the uh, the vote of 58 in the affirmative, 156 in the negative. So the main motion is unchanged. It, is, it remains the recommended vote from the ARB. Yeah, point of order? Yes. Um, as soon as the conversation keeps going, all of our votes, make sure they're up there after. Are we We haven't been doing that every time. We, we can scroll through. Uh, uh, um, yeah, we, we could do that here. Um, you, yeah, I guess usually I would do it on the, on the final vote, um, but we can do that here, since we haven't taken many of the electronic votes yet tonight. Okay, that's all the screens, all precincts. Um, and now I'll just remind everyone what we're voting on here. Uh, we're now voting on the, the main motion, which was the recommended vote from the redevelopment board. 
which has not been amended. Um, and this vote, so you would vote yes, once we open voting in a, in a moment, you, uh, you would vote yes if you wish to accept the ARB's recommended vote to make these, I'll go through the, we can, can we bring up the, uh, just to recap, uh, from the switch over to the annotated warrant, and we'll see, maybe if you can bear with me and scroll through as, as I uh, outline these four changes. I won't be able to read it in its entirety, but you'll be able to see on the screen. There's four sections of changes here. Uh, first is to amend the definitions of open space in section two of the zoning bylaw. Uh, the second change is to remove section 5.3.21 item D, which begins, quote, for mixed uses, quote. Um, three, add section 5.3.22 item C, for an exception for business districts. Um, I think we're a little bit behind on the display. And then the fourth set of changes is change the open space requirements in the table. Uh, let's see, in the table in section 5.5.2 item A titled B district open space and lot coverage by increasing some, but not all, of the landscaped open space requirements from 10% to 15 in some of the cases that you'll have to look at the table for. Can we scroll down to the table? And dropping the usable open space requirements that previously cited section 5.3.21 in that, uh, I believe it's the third column. So there are a bunch of, there used to be reference, or currently in the zoning bylaw, in the, it, it would have section, it cited section 5.3.21, that's being stricken by the main motion. And you can see all the, the, ten, the several, but not all of the 10% uh, requirements have been bumped up to 15. Okay. So if you're in favor of all of those changes, collectively, you would vote one for yes, if you're opposed to those changes and you want to keep the zoning bylaw in, intact, that'd be two. Mr. Weinstein? Oh, 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 oh let's hold off on, on yeah. Point Mr. of order. Weinstein, Precinct 21. Is this the majority vote or two thirds? Oh, I'm sorry, I should have stated that. This is a, this is a two thirds vote. Thanks for asking. Yes, this is a two thirds vote. I'll try to remember to uh, state that next time. Okay, so open voting. Okay, so vote one for yes to accept all of the changes in the ARB's recommended vote to amend the zoning bylaw. Vote two, if you don't want those changes and you wanna keep the zoning bylaw intact. And vote three, if you wish to abstain. And again, this is a two thirds vote. Okay, voting is now closed. And the motion carries, 167 in the affirmative, 53 in the negative. Uh, that is two thirds vote and I so declare it. And that brings us to, to article six. So uh, Mr. Revlak, are you, you wanna lead us off with the presentation? Okay, can we open the speaker queue for article six? Let's, cl let's clear that first, thank you. And speaker queue is open. We have a point of order. Yes. Okay. Okay. You can ask. I will. I will do my best to do so. Okay. And then now that speaker queue has been open for a moment, we can switch over to the presentation and give Mr. Revelak his time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Moderator, Steve Revelak, member of the Redevelopment Board. I see that the slides are being shared, so thank you for that. So I will be taking you through Warrant Article 6. This is a proposed zoning bylaw amendment r related to rear yard setbacks in the business districts. Next slide, please. So Article 6 proposes a simplification to the rear yard setback requirements in business districts. So this is one of a set of articles intended to encourage the redevelopment of underutilized properties in the business districts and create more needed and desired commercial space in the few areas of town zone for business development. So currently, rear yard setback requirements are formulaic. 
uh, based on the length and height of the building. Some of the formulas in our bylaw, and you can see them here, are things like 10 plus L over 10, where L is the length of the building, or H plus L over 6, where H and L are the length and height. So these formulas make it difficult to gauge build-out potential of parcels because you don't know what kind of building you can build until you know what the setback requirements are, but you don't know what the setback requirements are until you know what kind of a building you're thinking about building. So there is a catch-22 inherent in these setback formulas, and we'd like to make the bylaws simpler and more straightforward to reason about. So the changes proposed under Article 6 would establish a fixed set of rear yard setbacks in the business districts based on the height of the building and the surrounding context. So these rear yard setbacks proposed under Article 6 are zero feet when the building abuts an alley or right of way at least 10 feet wide, 10 feet in the rear yard setback when the rear yard abuts a non-residential district, 20 feet when three stories or less abuts a residential district, and 30 feet when four stories or more abuts a residential district. The height varies with, you know, essentially what is behind the, the, the parcel. Next slide, please. So staff in the Department of Planning and Community Development did a survey of rear yard setback requirements in some of our neighboring communities, like Burlington, Lexington, Medford, Somerville, and Watertown. And these communities typically require between 10 and 30 foot rear yard setbacks in their business districts. None use formulaic requirements as Arlington does. Next slide. To summarize, this amendment will simplify rear yard setback requirements in the business districts, making them easier to calculate and more context specific to the adjacent neighbors. Uh, the ARB voted four to zero at their October 2nd meeting to recommend favorable action on Article 6. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Revlak. We have a couple of amendments that have been submitted. Uh, we'll start with uh, Mix Pretzer from the satellite room. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. David Pretzer, Precinct 17. Um, I uh, introduced an amendment. I, I, I want to start by thanking the ARB for this proposal. I think overall this is a great idea. The current requirements are definitely confusing, and this really helps. Uh, my, I, I would modify the ARB's recommendation slightly um, by making the setback not depend on building height, so that um, buildings um, that are adjacent to residential would require a 20-foot setback regardless of height, and no building would require a 30-foot setback. Um, looking, you know, many of our uh, B district parcels are small, and looking at examples of them, um, it seemed to me that 30 feet would unnecessarily discourage four or five story mixed use buildings. Um, when town meeting voted to allow these buildings, I think we want them to actually happen in practice. And I don't want unnecessary barriers to, to having mixed use buildings to produce housing and support our businesses. Um, and there are some parcels in Arlington that are only uh, 60 feet deep. So if you have a 30 foot rear setback on a 60 foot deep parcel, then half your parcels in the setback, and then just that rear setback. Uh, and then, you know, that sort of, it seems like it's likely to get mostly used for surface parking, and it feels like we're prioritizing parking over housing at that point. I think a 20 foot setback is sufficient, and by making the setback more consistent, this avoids discouraging four and five story buildings. So if you're in favor of four and five story mixed use buildings, I encourage you to vote for my amendment. And regardless, I think we should vote for the main motion. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, can we... Uh, oh, and actually... I, I, I move to amend the main motion via my amendment. Okay, we have a second of that motion. It is now pending before us. Thank you. Uh, let us uh, now take uh, uh, Mr. Loretti. Uh, you have an amendment to introduce. Uh, if we could bring that up on the display. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. I moved the amendment that was distributed to you, um, both electronically and in hard copy on the rear table, which would slightly modify the situation where there is a zero yard, rear yard setback to remove lots where the, the rear of which abuts a right of way of 10 feet or less. Could I have a second, please? And Mr. Moderator, could I have the presentation that I prepared, please? 
Yes, we bring up the presentation. We had, and in case anyone missed it, we had a, a, a motion to uh, uh, put this amendment before us, and we had a second, so it is now pending as well. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, this uh, is the wrong slide deck. Article 6. Um, while he's doing that, I, I noticed, noted with some amusement at the warrant article hearing for this article that the speaker before me on a separate article had accused the Redevelopment Board of trying to turn Arlington into Somerville. Um, well, you should know in this case... On, on the previous in, article? In, in this case, the bylaw amendment before you by the Redevelopment Board comes straight from Somerville. It is there. Um, it is their zoning bylaw for rear yard setbacks. But having said that, I think it's fine with this minor exception. Hold on, we're still, we have the wrong uh, presentation here. We're looking for a uh, presentation from Mr. Loretti. This is the, the, the amendment. There should be a, a slide deck as well. Oh, I saw, a present, I saw a slide deck that said Loretti, uh, Article 7. It, is it just, maybe it's mislabeled? It should be 6, but I thought I saw Loretti Amendment 7, maybe, which does not exist. Oh, it's P, P7, I'm sorry, not, not Article 7, my mistake. Yeah, the presentation, so, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Okay, that, that's that's it. it, thank you. Sorry um, for the confusion, go ahead. Thanks. Next slide, please. The reason I'm, I'm putting this forward is um, we have a railroad right-of-way in Arlington called the Minuteman Bikeway, and the way the ARB's article is written, I could foresee developers coming forward and saying, well, this um, bikeway for the bike, path is really a right-of-way, I deserve a zero um, rear, yard, your rear yard setback. I don't think that's appropriate. And what this map is showing in the um, colored parcels that are pink and reddish are business zone parcels that abut the bike path. So what, this, what my amendment would do is require for those parcels that it, it not be a zero um, foot setback. Instead, um, next slide please. The, um, these parcels would have a 10-foot setback because they would be abutting a non-residential um, zoning district, in this case, the open space district. And as I said, in this case, the um, you know, developer of the property could not claim that they are abutting, a, a, well, they could claim they're abutting a right-of-way. It wouldn't have any effect because we've taken out that um, zero-foot setback for uh, rights of way. So that's, that's one objective of this amendment. The other occurs, next, next slide please, is more typically, or, or it's actually not very typical in Arlington, but the other time you can have a rear yard abutting a right-of-way is when you have a street that's a right-of-way both in front of your lot and behind your lot. They're really pretty rare. That's already taken care of in the zoning bylaw. That's referred to as a through lot. And section 5.3.8 of the zoning bylaw deals with that. What it says is when you have a, a through lot, you've got two front yards, and therefore you have, you, have to, you have to meet the same front yard setbacks for each of those streets uh, frontages. Now, as a practical matter, th that doesn't have a whole lot of effect, too, if you're concerned about mixed use, because the front yard setback for mixed use is zero. So it's still going to be zero whether you pass this amendment or not for mixed use. But for other uses in the business district that have more than a zero uh, foot setback, such as apart apartment buildings, um, townhouses, then the regular front yard setback for those, um, for those types of developments would apply. So I view this as ra a rather modest um, proposal, primarily to protect the bike path and also to avoid a potential conflict in the zoning bylaw where you do have a street -wide right of way behind the property um, which is already covered, and then this new different set of regulations that the Redevelopment Board is proposing for certain types of uses in that case. So I ask you to support this article, and I ask you to not support the um, other amendment, because I think Somerville and in general did a really good job with this particular regulation. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Loretti. Uh, so I just want to call to everyone's attention. I'm, I'm looking at the annotated warrant. And 
let's see, this is for Article 6. If you look at the vote language, um, that table isn't as clear, and it might not be correct. Compar I'm comparing that just visually now. I did not catch this earlier, I apologize, with the uh, redevelopment board's report. Um, let's see. Yeah, so you'll see here, for instance, that, that right rear yard in feet column. It looks like there's a strikeout across 20 feet with a tick and an asterisk. And can, do you happen to have in the presentation computer, uh, can you bring up the redevelopment board report because it's more clear there and I think correct. Um, is that, yes, it's, uh, this is page, it's 14 according to the PDF, it's page 11 printed on the page, or you could click it from the table of contents. So I wanna make sure everyone has the right Yep, I, I have it. Uh, yep, thanks. All right, and so you can see here, uh, this I believe is the redevelopment board's intention since it's in their report. You'll see that there are strikeouts in that right column under rear yard with an, uh, an underline for the asterisk. The asterisk is new, that's being added by, uh, uh, by this main motion, the recommended vote, and then also the, those asterisks correspond to the asterisks down below where all those footnotes are being added, um, which correspond to uh, all those asterisks in the right column of the table. Hopefully that's clear now. And that's not how it's visually displayed in the annotated warrant. So please consult, and I just caught that now, I apologize. Please refer to the redevelopment board's report for the canonical changes here under this article. Um, so those footnotes are all new, they're all labeled with asterisks, and they're cited now for several, but not all of the uh, items in that right column for rear yard. Okay. Okay, so let's now go to the speaker queue. Uh, Ms. Kepka. Hello, um, Asha Kepka, Precinct 1. Um, I actually oppose um, this article. Um, I have a personal story. Um, you know, setbacks are used in today's uh, urban planning to provide more space and adequate light and air. Um, in dense urban communities, they are necessary for greenery and open space to thrive. Um, when used correctly, they can add value to buildings. Um, they can be used as terrace, green space, flex space, as we saw in, during the pandemic. Um, most importantly, um, the setbacks are very important for, um, in case of emergency. They promote fire safety by space, spacing buildings and their protruding parts away from each other and allow passage of firefighting apparatus between buildings. Um, a few years ago, I actually experienced um, a fire. Um, I was not home, and uh, um, a visitor to a building next to me uh, threw a cigarette on a mulch within two minutes. Uh, my whole backyard was gone. Um, luckily, somebody, uh, passenger, passerby saw um, the fire, called the fire department, but within just a few minutes, my fence was gone, my yard was gone, my furniture was gone, um, and if it wasn't for my patio, which served as a setback, um, my house would have been gone. I do think the setbacks are here for a reason, and you know, um, it's not healthy, it's not safe to put too many buildings, whether residential or business, so close together. Um, just because in case there's emergency, we need to um, be able to rescue people, rescue property. Um, so I do urge everybody to vote against um, changing the setbacks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Loretti, did we, I believe we did move your motion, did we not? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, we'll take uh, Mr. Kepline next. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mark Kepline, Precinct 9. My fire safety is very important to me also, and rear access can be a matter of life and death. Um, every time there's a fire in Dorchester, Triple Decker, quite often you see neighboring buildings also involved. Somebody smokes on the back porch or has a, an illegal barbecue there. It's, it's a disaster which affects the neighborhood with many people displaced from their homes. Uh, another problem I have with the article is the first part about a rear right of way or alleyway. Uh, these are rare in our current business districts and um, they're important for placing dumpsters. And if the right of way is only 10 feet and garbage trucks are eight feet wide, along with fire trucks, there really isn't room for a four foot deep dump, small dumpster and that more space is required back there, including also for say delivery drivers to park temporarily or even uh, business owners or um, merchants working at a store. So I, th I think that zero setback is inadequate in that case. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kepline. Uh, we're now at the uh, at 9:30. Uh, this debate might go on for a little bit, so why don't we take a we'll take a 10-minute break starting now. I'll set the timer, and we'll come back in 10 minutes and resume Article Six. Thank you. Please be prompt. Okay. Apologies for the delay. During the the break, I was informed that we ran out of copies of the redevelopment board report and given the, uh, the display or formatting issues uh, of the vote language in the annotated warrant, um, we just uh, sent someone to print additional copies to ensure that everyone has a paper copy in hand, which was uh, the intention of the guidelines to make sure everyone has an opportunity to see the vote language in advance or at least have paper copies at the meeting um, uh, so that everyone knows what they're voting on. Um, so we will get those copies uh, to you as quickly as we can. And apologies for that, uh, uh, for running out of those copies. Uh, so we'll now go back to the speaker queue. Do we still have the same speaker queue up? Okay, great. Um, was this reset during the, it was not reset, okay. Okay. So let's now take uh, Mr. Weinstein. We're back on Article 6. Thank you, Mr. Uh, moderator. Jordan Weinstein, Precinct 21. I uh, have risen to uh, speak in favor of uh, Chris Loretti's uh, amendment to Article 6. I think that he points out something that probably was overlooked by, uh, unintentionally by the uh, uh, redevelopment board and uh, that they probably would want it inserted uh, in there anyway. Um, and uh, in particular, the uh, unless this language is amended, as Chris points out, um, and it's a very simple amendment by simply taking away the uh, half the line of the asterisk that says zero feet when abutting an alley, uh, and scratching out or rear right of way uh, of at least uh, 10 feet of width. That's to avoid any developer from taking advantage of this loophole and building right on uh, the uh, Minuteman bikeway, uh, seeing that and defining that as a right of way, which it may legally. So um, that's the main reason why I support this amendment. Uh, it's the Loretti Amendment, the first one. and. Uh, yeah, really, I, I would not want a dumpster right up against my house or to see my uh, backyard burn, or my house burn for a lack of a backyard. And uh, also, you gotta give those delivery trucks more room these days, which we, get, we have more of them. So I support uh, the amendment, uh, the Loretti Amendment to Article 6, and uh, I oppose the uh, Zavid Pretzer uh, Amendment. Thank you. Great, thank you. And just as a clarification, the, the first amendment that was moved was the 
uh, the Pretzer Amendment, and the second amendment moved was the Loretti Amendment. Uh, and next in the speaker queue, queue uh, uh, well, we heard from Mr. Jalkett. Let's just skip uh, forward now to Mr. Prokosh. Uh, Mr. Prokosh. Arthur Prokosh, Precinct 4. So first, um, I have a question for the Arlington Redevelopment Board, if that's in order. Uh, I am curious, um, per the main motion here, would setbacks necessarily be smaller? Uh, someone from the Redevelopment Board, Mr. Revelak? Uh, not necessarily. So we'll give a formula, their formulas, so we'll give, I'll give you a formula answer. So one of the formulas is H plus L over six. Okay, height. So picture a building 60 feet wide, right? So that's, that's H is 60. Now picture, or actually L is 60, L is 60. So, but let, let's make sure, let's, let's have it be 60 feet tall too. All right, so 60 by 60. So H and L is 120, 120 divided by six is 20 feet, which is, you know, that is not necessarily smaller than what we're proposing here. If the building were only 30 feet tall, then the bylaw would require a smaller setback than what this, uh, than what this article would propose. And approximately how many stories might a 30 or 60 foot be? So 30 feet, um, oh, 30 feet would be a very tight three stories. Three stories is usually a little above. 60 feet is more like a five story building. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, um, and I, I have a couple other just questions because there have been a lot of hypothesizing. I want to make sure we're talking about fact. Um, so I'm curious, um, perhaps the, the planning t department could speak to this, if there's a difference between fire standards for the type of new construction that would be possible with this amendment, or excuse me, with this main motion um, for multi-floor mixed-use development versus, for example, all wood construction um, from three decker's. Uh, anything that, that, that is Mr. Champa, uh, are you able to answer that question? How you doing, Mike Champa, Director of Inspectional Services. Can you just repeat the question so I make sure. sure I have it right? So yeah, I was just, in general terms, I was wondering if you could characterize the differences in um, fire safety or fire standards yep. for new construction of a multi-floor mixed-use building versus an existing wood three-decker. Yeah, so all of these buildings would be required to be sprinkled and have fire alarm, uh, and there may be additional fire ratings added to the exterior walls. And um, to uh, the earlier point of, of fires and spreading of fires, there's additional fire protections that are required based on proximity of buildings to other buildings. So um, it's all covered in the building code. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, all right. And so I have a final question, which is as to um, the gap between the edge of the paved bike path and the legal edge of the MBTA right of way. I'm curious what the range of that is. Um, is that many feet? Is that a couple of feet? Is that zero feet? Do we have any sense of that in general terms? Anyone from the redevelopment board or the planning department or inspectional, well, not inspectional services, but yeah, Ms. Ricker. Thank you, thank you for your question. Um, I am not an expert on the width of the right of way of, uh, you know, for the, for the, for the bike way. I'm sorry, um, just name and title for the. Oh, I, I apologize, <laughs> my name is Claire Ricker. I am your director of planning and community development for the town of Arlington. Um, I, like I said, I'm not an expert on the amount of right-of-way, but I do know that there is um, extensive amount of right-of-way on either side of the paved area of the bike path. Um, you know, off the top of my head, I think, you know, most rail right-of-way is, you know, no less than, say, 40 feet. So there could be as much as 10 foot already existing on um, either uh, on distance uh, uh, from the paved section of the, of the, uh, of the bike path. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I just want to close here by, by mentioning that um, I support businesses. I especially support those businesses that, that serve cyclists and walkers. 
Um, for example, like the bike stop in Arlington, which faces immediately up to the edge of the bike path, as I understand it. Um, and there are other examples of buildings fronting the bike path that I think work very well in Lexington uh, and, yes, in Somerville. Um, and so for, for these reasons, I um, suggest, uh, I, I urge you to vote no on the Loretti Amendment, yes on the Pretzer Amendment, and yes on the main motion. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, let's take Mr. Hamlin next. Pass. Pass. That's it. Mr. Schlickman. And just a reminder, everyone being like or unlike Somerville is not in the warrant article text. <laughs> Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9, solidly in Arlington. Um, all of a sudden, I'm a little confused because I'd like to sort of ask for an expert from, say, the Redevelopment Board to uh, answer a couple of questions here. So what would be the legal definition of an alley as applied under this bylaw? Uh, does anyone from the Redevelopment Board have an answer to Mr. Slickman's question? Mr. Revelak? I'm not going to recite the definition, but I can tell you where to find it. <laughs> so it is not a defined term in our zoning bylaw, uh, in which case uh, the definition, our zoning bylaw takes the meaning of, I think it's Merriam Webster's unabridged dictionary. Oh. It mentions this in chapter two. So whatever they say is an alley is an alley. That's interesting. This is in section two, definitions of the zoning bylaw, words not defined in either place shall have the meaning given in the most recent edition of Webster's unabridged dictionary. I've been in town meetings since like 1993, and, and, and you learn something new every meeting, I don't know. Um, what is a rear right of way? How is that defined? How would I know what I see, uh, see that as a right of way that would be apl uh, applied here? M Mr. Revelak, unless someone has a copy of Webster's Unabridged Dictionary. So the, um, do I need to define right of way? Uh, for the purposes of interpreting what we have before us. Okay, so a right-of-way is generally an area where the public can pass. You know, typically it's a street and sidewalks. So if you have a, if your parcel abuts, like say a street and then an alley, the alley is considered a right-of-way. But what is the rear? So the rear comes from uh, the definition of a rear lot line mm -hmm. and, and basically the, uh, the primary one Actually, this is a good question. So the <laughs> rear yard, so the rear yards, I can say that the rear yards, they are both required to have the same setback on the front and the rear because they're both considered front yards. Um, it's 538B or something. Um, I, I think for the purposes of interpreting which is the front, the bigger, it would be the bigger street. So for the purposes of this bylaw, Mr. Loretti is raising an interesting point uh, of the bikeway, which we could say is a right of way because people do have the right to pass on it, but we could say that it is zoned for transit and it is rail banked property. So a railroad is a right of way, but maybe not. I don't know. I, I don't know the definition. So I'm wondering if the criticism of abutting the right of way onto the Minuteman bikeway uh, it, uh, I, uh, there's a smile over there. It looks like somebody's got an, uh, got an answer. And also, I saw a hand in the... Uh, uh, Mr. Rudiman, did you have an answer to this question? Okay. So I was well, going well, to say... Um, yeah, Mr. I, Rev Revlack and then Mr. Rudiman. I, I learned something in this case. So uh, the definition of a front lot line is the property line dividing a lot from a street right of way. For the purposes of this definition, neither the Minuteman bikeway nor any railroad right of way shall be deemed a street right of way. Oh, so, the, so this does not apply to the Minuteman bikeway. Excellent, because hypothetically, at some point, it would be a lovely thing to see some uh, construction equipment, uh, cranes, things digging, little uh, oh, a cut and cover building a rail line in there. And I want to make sure, no, this is within scope, because the question is, if at some point, 
somebody came along and wanted to build a subway on the Minuteman right-of-way, would there be room to do it given the definitions under this bylaw? That, I think, is a legitimate question. And if we're planning for the future, one of the future things we have is a rail-banked uh, bike path where there are existing plans to build a subway. And if that at some point should happen, I don't want to encroach upon things that would be important for the construction. So I'm sort of trying to figure out whether this applies. And it sounds like the, the Minuteman bikeway is not a, a right of way under the law. So thus, Mr. Loretti's amendment is moot when applied to the bikeway. So that answers my question. That gets me where I want to be. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Loretti, I will invite you up very briefly to, uh, if you, Since, since there were a variety of opinions, I, I wonder, if, uh, just, to, just slides, to, to clarify definitions. My slides are still available. I have these definitions on them, and I'd like to refer to them just for a second. If I could, it's after the extra section where it says zoning bylaw definitions. And I think a key point that Mr. Schlickman missed is that exclusion of the Minuteman bikeway only applies to a front lot line, yet the bylaw revision the ARB is talking about is the rear lot line. And I did not copy the definition of the rear lot line, but it does not say anything about excluding the Minuteman bikeway. Okay. So I, I agree, if we were talking about a front lot line, then Mr. Schlickman would be correct, but we're not. We're, it, the bylaw change that the ARB is putting forth specifically relates to rear lot lines. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so there are a variety of opinions or interpretations of definitions. Uh, let's take, I think we heard from Mr. Owen earlier, let's take Mr. Moore next. Uh, let's take Mr. Greenspong. Uh, Andy Greenspawn, Precinct 5. Uh, can I ask, I, I'm sorry, this is very confusing, I think, for a lot of people. Can I ask the ARB to respond to what uh, Mr. Loretti said? Because I don't understand the definitions anymore. Okay. <laughs> Someone, uh, does a member of the ARB wish to respond to the definitions we just discussed? And it might be useful for the meeting to clarify the distinction between the front uh, lines versus the, the rear lines. Yeah. Sure. So, Claire Ricker, Director of Planning and uh, Community Development. Um, the definition of the front uh, lot line uh, is, as uh, Mr. Revelak pointed out, not um, applicable to the Minuteman bikeway. The rear lot line um, is defined. <clears throat> uh, I'm just taking a look here to see. Lot line rear, any lot line which is parallel to or within 45 degrees of being parallel to a front lot line, except for a lot line itself that is a front lot line. Another perhaps useful definition here would be right of way itself, which is the line determining the public limit or ownership on a street or highway. So by those definitions and your interpretation, the Minuteman does not count as a rear right of way. Okay, I get the affirmative, okay. Um, I have a couple other quick questions. Um, in terms of the setbacks for different stories, um, it says 20 feet for three or fewer stories and then 30 feet for four or more stories when abutting residential. So if, is my interpretation of this amendment um, correct that if someone wanted to build a three-story building near a residential, there would be a 20-foot setback, but if they wanted to build a four-story building, every story would have to be 30 feet setback? Uh, can someone from the redevelopment board, Mr. Revelak, answer that? Yes, uh, that interpretation is correct. Okay, um, I hate to complicate things more because there was some discussion about, dare I say, Somerville zoning bylaws, and I don't know if the way this was, I don't, can I ask the motivation for how these setbacks were determined? If anyone in the ARB can, can answer. Can someone from the redevelopment board explain how you arrived at these setbacks? So back in uh, December of 2022, uh, 
planning department staff did a survey of setback requirements in business districts in some of our neighboring communities and provided a set of options. Uh, this, what you're seeing in this main motion happens to be one of those options. And uh, the board felt this was appropriate because it was both easy to understand and contextually sensitive to the height of the building and what is uh, surrounding or behind it. Okay, um, thank you. So I, I do think it would be hard for any building to go above four stories in this situation because of the reasons mentioned in um, Prisoners, uh, sorry, um, the amendment to switch this from 30 to 20 because you're not going to get a 40 story, uh, a four story building if you only have 60 feet across and you have 30 foot rear setback and need a front setback. I did look into uh, our neighbor's zoning bylaws um, and for the, them, it's for the first three stories, it's 20 foot setback when abutting a residential and any story above is 30 foot setback which makes sense to me for shadows and various things for abutting residential. I unfortunately did not have time to propose any amendments here that would be to that effect, so I'm giving that as information for the town meeting. Um, other than that, I would say I would still support the amendment to switch from 30 feet to 20 foot setbacks um, because I think as is this would make, given the parcel sizes in town making uh, any four-story buildings in any of these districts basically impossible because I think it actually would make rear setbacks even larger than the current weird formula. So I support that amendment. I am against the Loretti amendment, though I'm not sure it has legal standing given these definitions, and I support broadly the existing article as proposed. Great, thank you. Let's take Mr. Jamison next. Thank you, Ms. Moderator, Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12. I move the article and all, all matters before us. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate under uh, all matters under Article 6. Um, we have a second. Let's try this by voice vote. All those in favor of terminating deb debate on Article 6 and all matters before it, say yes. Yes. All those opposed? No. The yeses have it. Debate is terminated. Okay. So, uh, so let's take. So we're taking up the amendments in the order that we moved them. So we'll be taking up the Pretzer amendment first. Um, so can we bring up uh, the the PDF for the Article Six Pretzer amendment on the display? Okay. Thank you. And so you see all these lines with the, uh, that begin with an asterisk. All of these lines were, uh, are proposed in the ARB recommended vote in the main motion to, to add all these asterisk lines. And the Pretzer Amendment uh, is making these changes to this whole section that's being introduced by the ARB's recommended vote. And so, so the, the, the Pretzer Amendment uh, will strike from the third asterisk line for three or fewer stories, and it strikes the fourth asterisk line in its entirety. Okay. And so let's now go to a vote on the Pretzer Amendment. So if you are in favor of those changes that we just showed on the screen of rem removing the the, uh, uh, the voting is now open, removing the restriction uh, of four, three, or fewer stories, and removing that, that fourth bullet point or asterisk about 30 feet for four or more stories. If you're in favor of striking those pieces of text from the recommended vote of the ARB, you would vote yes. If you want to leave the recommended vote as is, uh, not amended by those changes, then you would vote two for no, or you can vote three to abstain and stay out of it. <laughs> yeah, and this is the majority vote on whether to apply the Pretzer Amendment to the main motion. Okay, voting is now closed. And the motion fails, 84 in the affirmative, 123 in the negative. The main motion remains unamended. Uh, it's, not very, it's not particularly close, so I'm not gonna scroll through the screens. 
Uh, let's now show the PDF for the Loretti Amendment under Article 6. Okay. And rather than repeating all those asterisk lines, which I asked Mr. Loretti to not put in there because it would put the amendments in conflict, we have just the one asterisk line of zero feet when abutting an alley, and Mr. Loretti's amendment would strike the remaining text, which reads, or rear right of way of at least 10 feet of width. Uh, so we'd remove that second clause starting with the or, uh, but then would otherwise leave the main motion unchanged, except for this one, the striking of that clause. So if you are in favor of striking that clause from that asterisk line from the main motion, from the ARB, then you'd vote yes to strike it, vote two to leave the main motion unamended, not changed, um, and three to abstain. So let's now open voting on uh, the Loretti Amendment under Article 6. If you're in favor of that change to the main motion to remove that clause, uh, vote one for yes. If you want to leave the main motion, the recommended vote of the ARB unchanged, you could press two for no, or you could press three to abstain. Two, did I, two to abstain. One for yes to take the change two to remain unchanged, and three to abstain, sorry. Okay, voting is now closed. Again, this is a majority vote and it fails. Uh, it's very close, so we can scroll through the screens for the 101 in the affirmative, 105 in the negative. Um, and again, it's, a major, it's always a majority vote to make an amendment to a main motion. Uh, and so we'll scroll through the screens. It's very close. there. Okay. And that is all precincts. So now we'll move on to the main motion, which is the recommended vote of the ARB, and it has remained unamended. Uh, I'm sorry? And yes, it, thank you. It is a two-thirds vote on the main motion. Um, and so before we open voting, let me just summarize as best I can that uh, we're now voting on the main motion under Article 6. This is the recommended vote of the ARB. Uh, vote, you, you will, once voting opens, you can uh, press 1 to vote yes to accept the ARB's recommended vote to amend Section 5.5.2 of the Zoning Bylaw, uh, the section titled Dimensional and Density Requirements, replacing several of the entries in the rightmost column of the table the right column under minimum requirement, rear yard with an asterisk in several of the entries that refers to several criteria that we saw of those asterisk or bulleted lines uh, with newly proposed footnotes. So if you're in favor of all of those changes uh, from the recommended vote of the ARB, you'd vote one for yes, two for no to leave the zoning bylaw unchanged, uh, and three to abstain. Okay, voting is open. And this is a two-thirds vote. Okay, voting is now closed. And the motion carries. 173 in the affirmative, 37 in the negative. Um, and we will now move on to Article 7. Uh, Article 6 is disposed of. Okay, so uh, Mr. Revlack, are you introducing Article 7? Okay. Oh, and before he comes up, I can, uh, let's open the speaker, let's show and open the speaker queue. Let's switch over to that. Uh, could we clear this out? Okay, speaker queue is reset and open. Um, Mr. Revlack, and then just, uh, I, maybe no one has anything to comment on this. Uh, 
Okay, so let's switch over to Mr. Revelock's presentation, and you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Steve Revelock, member of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. I'd like to request the submitted slides for Article 7 be shared at this time. There we go. All right, thank you. So I will be taking you through Warrant Article 7. This is a proposed zoning bylaw amendment related to step backs in the business districts. This is one of a set of articles that's intended to encourage the redevelopment of underutilized properties in the business districts and create more needed and desired commercial space. Next slide, please. So I'll start with some background. What is a step back? So a step back is when the upper stories of a building come in a few feet away from the street. From the perspective of someone standing in the front of the building, the step back uses, kind of uses the lower stories to conceal the upper ones. Uh, it makes the building seem less big. It also creates a built-in requirement for some variation in the facade. Next slide, please. So Arlington currently has an upper story step back requirement. Starting at the fourth story, uh, the building has to step back seven and a half feet on each side of the building with street frontage. So on Arlington's business parcels, roughly 44% of them are on corner lots with street frontage on two sides and uh, sometimes three. Combining that, you know, the multiple street frontages with the fact that a lot of these parcels in the business district are small, the requirement to have a step back on multiple sides is, um, it can you know, make it challenging to develop upper story residential space. So Article 7 proposes to change the step back requirement so that it only applies on the primary facade. Uh, the primary facade will be along, you know, the side facing Mass Ave or Broadway unless there was a compelling reason to choose otherwise. Article 7 also clarifies that the step back is to be measured from the property line. Next slide, please. Now, staff in the Department of Planning and Community Development surveyed business district step back requirements in other communities, and most don't have them. Of the communities that do require step backs, it's generally uh, for step backs uh, well above the fourth story, uh, typical uh, 65 feet is, is, is one, one measure, uh, which is about a six story building. Next, uh, nope, this is the last slide. So this amendment addresses a challenge in redeveloping the upper stories of mixed use buildings, particularly on smaller corner lots. The ARB voted three to one at their October 2nd meeting to recommend favorable action on Article 7. So the board member who voted no was in favor of the amendment, but preferred the step back requirements start at the fifth floor rather than remaining at the fourth. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Revlock. Let's uh, switch over to the speaker queue. Uh, Mr. Wagner, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Moderator Carl Wagner, Precinct 15. Um, the previous speaker, the proponent said it well that the step back is there to make the building less massive to those that have to uh, look on it or pass by it. And they also affect uh, solar access. And they affect solar access not just on the primary or the front side, but to the abutters on the backs and the sides. And uh, Arlington has done nothing yet to protect um, houses, but particularly solar panels, and we really should. What this would do is it would say only the front side would keep any kind of, of that setback, and we really shouldn't be going that direction. I also want to point out that this article, like Articles 5 through 11, never had anybody from the public to be able to go to a public meeting since last town meeting. This was first presented when it was presented to the ARB on the 18th of September, a rainy day, only in person. So, abutters and people that could be affected by this change never had the chance to have a public meeting to hear the questions of others or to ask their own. They never had a chance to write in to the town. In every instance in my life in this town, when changes to zoning happen, including all the other articles 4 through 11 or 5 through 11 effectively, the public has had meetings, much like in this room, and people have said, hey, wait, adjust this because it affects all these things. 
We are 190 or maybe we're 211 people at the moment who are voting on changes that will affect massive buildings and most importantly, the abutters and the people around them. I think this deserves to have, like the other articles through 11, uh, public input. So I would ask you to vote no on this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Uh, let's, uh, we can show the, are we showing? Yeah, yeah, the speaker queue. Uh, let's go ahead to Mr. Uh, Aram, um, who we haven't heard from tonight yet. Aram Holman, Precinct 6, I urge you to vote against this. As this has been described, uh, this step back will only apply to the principal facade. Generally, tall buildings present their nicest facade to the main street. In general, the facades present uh, on other sides of the building are uh, less attractive, sometimes considerably less attractive. What you're really doing is sending a message to most of the abutters, people who are not on the main streets, but on side streets, the people who will be facing taller buildings than they've experienced before. You're unimportant. You don't count. It's not necessary for you to be relieved of any of the appearance of massiveness that this will cause. This nice facade with some limitations will be seen only from these front sides, only from the passers-by. I think that does a disservice to the many people who are going to be near these buildings. Uh, they, this building will not be invisible to them, but these people will be rendered less visible to the rest of the town. I urge you to vote against this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holman, and I apologize for misspeaking your name when I recognized you. Um, let's take uh, Mr. Benson next. Eugene Benson, Precinct 10, just a couple of quick points. We are still more restrictive with step backs than most communities in our area. And I think that's an important point to make. We are competing with other communities in our area for commercial buildings. And we need to be competitive on things like step backs. Secondly, right now, and another reason why the Redevelopment Board has put this forward, is it's unclear whether the step back is on the first floor, the fourth floor, as long as it adds up to the fourth floor. So this clarifies that it's from the property line and it can be on any number of floors as long as it makes it back to the fourth floor. Further, it's for street corners. It doesn't affect people behind because the step backs even currently only apply on street frontage. So I would urge you to vote in favor of this motion. Article. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Benson. Let's uh, skip ahead to Ms. Elliott, who I don't believe we've heard from tonight. Pass. Okay. Uh, Mr. Moore. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Christopher Moore, Precinct 14, motion to terminate debate. Okay. We have a motion to terminate debate. Do we have a, se we have a second? Um, yep, we have a second. So, uh, all those in favor of terminating debate on Article 7, say yes. Yes. All those opposed? No. I declare that it is a two-thirds vote, and debate is terminated. Uh, so, before we bring up voting on the main motion, there's no amendments here, so we'll go straight to the main motion. Uh, let me just summarize before we, we open voting. First of all, this is a two-thirds vote, uh, and if you... You can uh, vote yes to accept the Redevelopment Board's recommended vote to make changes in these three sections. Can we bring up the, um, uh, the recommended vote language? All right, so there's three sections that are being amended here by the main motion. Number one, update the definition of building step back in section two of the zoning bylaw to replace the text, all building elevations 
with the entire principal facade of a building and dropping the exclusion of alleys. Uh, the second section of change is multiple edits to section 5.3.17 titled upper story building step backs, including a new paragraph, which is one sentence about measurement of an upper story step back. And the third section of changes is removing section 5.3.21 item C, which is about upper story setbacks, which results in re-lettering of these subsequent items in that section. So it's those three sections that are being amended in the zoning bylaw by this recommended vote, which is the main motion before us. So let's now uh, open voting on the main motion of Article 7. Voting is now open. This is a two-thirds vote. And so if you're in favor of those three sections of changes that I just ran through, you can vote one for yes, two for no, to keep the zoning bylaw intact, and three to abstain. Mr. Jamison, do you have a point of order? It says the title is wrong. Zoning bylaw amendment step, step back requirements in business districts. Yes. So let, let's, let's hold off on the voting, the closing. Let, let's leave the voting for now. Uh, the title of the slide should read Zoning bylaw amendment step back requirements in business districts. Thank you, Mr. Jameson. That might be the name of a different article. That was the previous, yeah. Okay. So can we clear that out? Is, is that possible? And have the corrected language up there? Once again, the, the correct language, the title of this article is Zoning Bylaw Amendment Step Back Requirements in Business Districts. Mr. Gilbert, do you have the, the text that you need for that? Okay. Does anyone have a good playlist? Yeah, let the, can we rerun re the vote? So we we're talking about step backs. There we go. Okay, voting is now open for Article 7, the zoning bylaw amendment step back requirements in business districts. Vote one for yes to 
make those changes in those three sections of the zoning bylaw that I ran through earlier, vote two, to leave the zoning bylaw intact, and three, to abstain. Okay. Voting is now closed. This is a two-thirds vote, and it is, I, and it is affirmative. Uh, 140 in the affirmative, 60 in the negative. It is a two-thirds vote. Okay, so moving on to Article 8. Mr. Revlak, do you want to lead us off for the presentation? And before he comes up, uh, or before he gets started, can we, uh, op can we clear and open the speaker queue so everyone can see if they're getting in? Okay, speaker keys open. Mr. Revlak, you have the floor. And, can, and now that we've confirmed it's open, can we bring up Mr. Revlak's slides for Article 8? Thank you. Yep. All right, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Steve Revlak, member of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. So I'll be taking you through Warrant Article 8, which is a proposed zoning bylaw amendment related to height and story minimums in the business districts. Article 8 is one of a set of articles intended to encourage the redevelopment of underutilized properties in the business districts and to create more needed and desired commercial space in the few areas of town zoned for business development. Next slide. So Article 8's goal is to encourage traditional mixed-use development in the business districts with uses like retail or restaurants on the ground floor and office or residential space above. It's also a way to encourage more efficient use of the limited land resources in Arlington's business districts. Now to that end, Article 8 proposes a height minimum of two stories and 26 feet, unless there are site-specific circumstances that would make a second story infeasible. For example, the board would be unlikely to require a second story on a new gasoline service station. Article 8 would not require the owners of one-story commercial properties to add a second story. The requirement would only apply to new development. So this amendment tries to encourage higher value mixed use development in the business districts by requiring a minimum of two stories unless there are site specific conditions that would make a second story infeasible. The ARB voted four to zero at their October 2nd meeting to recommend favorable action on Article 8. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Revelak. Let's uh, switch over to the speaker queue. Uh, let's take Ms. Farrell, who we have not heard from yet. Pass. Uh, who else have we not heard from tonight? Uh, Ms. Mazina from the satellite room. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Angel Mazina, Precinct 15. I do agree with this article. I think it is <clears throat> prudent for us to make use of existing land and existing structures and maximize the usage um, and ability to build on residential if that's what we need to. Uh, I am in full support of this article. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's take uh, uh, Mr. Tosti next. We haven't heard from you tonight. Al Tosti, Precinct 17, move the question. Okay. Um, okay, that's not what I had in mind, but uh, we have a second to terminate debate. Um, uh, so we'll do this by voice vote. Um, all those in favor of terminating the debate uh, on Article 8, say yes. Yes. All those opposed? No. That is not a two-thirds vote. So uh, we had half a person standing. Um, one, two, three, okay. All right, all right. I shouldn't have opened my mouth. Um, <laughs> let's go to an electronic vote on terminating debate. And we can do that while retaining the speaker queue. All right. Okay. Great. Okay. All right. Voting is now open. If you wish to terminate debate on Article 8, uh, you feel like you heard everything you need to hear, vote 1 for yes. If you want to hear more and continue debate, press 2 uh, or 3 to abstain. Okay, voting is closed. 
And debate is terminated. It is a two-thirds vote, 141 in the affirmative, 58 in the negative. Okay. So let's now go to a, uh, well, before we open voting on the main motion, uh, let me just summarize what we're voting on here. This is a two-thirds vote for the main motion. Uh, vote yes to accept the, if you wish to accept the ARB's recommended vote to add section 5.5.2 item C. Can, actually, can we bring up the, uh, the vote language, please? Thank you. You might need to scroll through because there's a lot in here. So uh, we're adding section 5.5.2 item C to the zoning bylaw, which would be a new section titled minimum height and story requirements for the business districts, which specifies a minimum of two stories and 26 feet in height in business districts. These minima do not apply to single family residential buildings and the ARB reserves the right to waive or modify the height requirement if it's infeasible for the property or the project. Okay, so that's what we're voting on for the main motion of Article 8. So let's now open up voting and we'll all make sure we have the right text. Zoning bylaw amendment, height and story, minimums in business districts. I'd also accept minima as the plural. Okay. Voting is now open. This is the main motion under Article 8. Okay, voting's now closed, and the motion carries 185 in the affirmative, 23 in the negative. It is a two-thirds vote. That takes us to Article 9. Mr. Revelak, do you want to lead us off? And can we reset and open the speaker queue and show that on the display? Okay, speaker queue is now open. Mr. Revelak, you have the floor. Do we have a presentation slide deck to show? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Steve Revelak, member of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. So I will be taking you through Warrant Article 9. This is a proposed zoning bylaw amendment related to corner lot requirements. So Article 9 is one of the set of articles intended to encourage the redevelopment of underutilized properties in the business districts and to create more needed and desired commercial space in the few areas of town that are zoned for business development. It also seeks to clarify how the Arlington Redevelopment Board has been interpreting this aspect of the zoning bylaw. Uh, next slide, please. So under Arlington's bylaws, corner lots have multiple front yards. There's a front yard on each side of the property that abuts a street. Now, according to section 538 of our zoning bylaw, these, the depths of these front yards, quote unquote, shall be the same as the required front yard depths for the adjoining lots. So in other words, on a corner lot, the front yard setbacks are determined by what's on the adjacent parcels. Now in the vast majority of cases, a corner lot will be in the same district as the parcels that abut it, and section 538 produces a, a, a reasonably nice result. You get an even front setback as you go around the corner. Now where this becomes a challenge is in the cases where the corner lot is in a different zoning district than the abutting properties. Specifically, when the corner lot is in a business district and the abutting parcels are residential. Uh, next slide, please. So a commercial or mixed use building in a business district is generally allowed to have a zero foot front yard setback, uh, but residential parcels usually have setbacks of 20 or 25 feet. So applying residential setbacks on corner lots in business districts will, you know, tends to reduce the footprint of the building and the amount of commercial space available. So Article 9 would amend the zoning bylaw so that when a corner lot is in a business district, the business district setbacks apply. So there is a section of the bylaw, it's section 5316, that allows the ARB to adjust setback requirements during environmental design review. And Article 9 is largely a codification of how the board has been applying the bylaw in this regard. Uh, the board hopes this leads to more clarity and more predictability in the permitting process. So in summary, this amendment adjusts the setback requirements for corner lots in the business districts so that the setback requirements are based on the business district rather than the abutting parcels, which may be in a different district. 
the ARB voted 4-0 at their October 2nd meeting to recommend favorable action on Article 9. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mr. Revlock. Uh, and turning to the speaker queue, uh, let's take uh, Mr. Miller. Is there a Mr. Miller? Uh, do, you, do you wish to address the meeting? Oh, do you have a microphone upstairs? Is there a microphone? Uh, okay. Coming down, okay, in the meantime, um, let's see, uh, Mr. Warden? Oh, he's right here, okay. Yep, Mr. Miller, yep. And then we'll take Mr. Uh, Warden. Uh, apologies, Mr. Moderator. Uh, no Matt Miller, Precinct 11. Uh, this is just, I don't have an opinion, I just wanted clarification. So looking at that slide that we previously saw, um, there was a setback that was different on the corner versus the adjoining, uh, even though they were in, in the district, uh, business district. So uh, could that slide be brought up and clarified again, please? Yeah, can we bring up the slide? And Mr. Replock, do you want to explain that? I just wanted clarification. Thank you. So yes, the, in this diagram, you're, we see a corner lot which is intended to represent a parcel in the business districts. And abutting it on either side are our district properties. So the dashed red line on the B district parcel, the blue one, is intended to represent the setback in that particular business district. Now the dashed lines in the yellow parcels are intended to represent the setbacks in the residential districts. And what this slide is trying to convey is that if you were to apply the residential setbacks to the business district parcel, uh, you would basically ha lose a lot of buildable area. Um, whereas if the B, the B district setbacks were applied to the B district parcel, you'd have a, a larger developable area and would be able to, um, you know, it, it would allow you to get more commercial space on the parcel. Thank you. Just to further clarify, so typically you're not going to have a single corner that is in the district, uh, business district. Okay, just speak into the microphone, properties. please. Sorry, yeah. yeah. So typically you would not have um, a property on a corner that's in the business and there's residential on both sides of it. Is that true? Oh, uh, I, I'm just trying to clarify. Uh, Steve Revelock, Arlington Redevelopment Board. Uh, there are cases like that. Uh, we had one recently, a, a, few, uh, a few months ago. It's also reasonably common to have um, one of the two parcels be a, a residential district. So if you think of, you know, like Mass Ave as a commercial corridor, the, you know, the next, the next parcel in on a side street is residential. So then so then that would mean that if it was horizontal and this was Mass Ave going uh, horizontal, then there would be two blues. There would be two blues. Yep, that's all I wanted. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So you might say B district parcel qualifies as a corner case. Mr. Warden, you're, you're next. Two mics here? The other one. The other one. Okay. Thank you. Uh, John Worden, Precinct 8. Um, <clears throat> I have a, 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 problem, a problem with this uh, insofar as the, the, um, uh, a, a, a multiple story uh, building, and we've just uh, voted to have make uh, one story buildings. Well, you can't you can't have one story building anymore. You have to have a two story building, and a one uh, a one story building uh, at at the sidewalk level and a and a residential zone just behind it. Though that's not too bad. You start putting multiple stories there, and then then you, you you're really pushing the the the, the height shadow and, and all those uh, unfortunate results upon the people whose houses are down the street. So I, I, I would I would suggest that that the uh, uh, this, this should go back to the board 
uh, for consideration of if it's a one if it's a one story, yeah, it's okay to have that um, have that uh, uh, w w w w waive the side setback requirement. But if it's a multiple story, I, I think the this setback requirement uh, sh should should not should should apply. Um, uh, only to the first floor, and the other floors should be set back a bit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, let's take Mr. Klein next. And I will assume that Mr. Warden was not making a motion to refer, so we'll take Mr. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Christian Klein, Precinct 10. Um, I just had a quick question. The language that's being added, it uh, says, Corner lot shall have minimum uh, street yards with depth for its front and side yard as required by the front and side yard requirements. Um, the side yard has not been mentioned in this discussion, so I wanted to ask how that applies. Mr. Revelak. So, uh, can you repeat that language, Mr. Klein? Uh, sure. So it's the, what's the language that's being added that's underlined, it says, except in the business districts, a corner lot shall have the minimum street yards with depth for its front and side yard as required okay. by the front and side yard setback requirements as applicable. Can, can we bring up the amendment text up here? The bylaw amendment, uh, the main motion. Yeah. Thank you. That's uh, the... Actually, that is a little extraneous because the side, the corner lot does have a side yard, um, which is, you know, of the two front of the two front yards, you get to pick one of the opposite sides as a rear, one as a side. Um, but in this case, the side would be the side yard of the business district. Okay, so effectively, the to what we're saying is that the side yard, the side yard which would have applied anyways, is still applying. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Great, thank you. Let's, uh, let's take Mr. Gast from the uh, satellite room. I move the matter and all matters before. The, I move the article and all matters before us. Okay. Uh, we, have, we have a motion to terminate debate on Article 9. Do we have a second? We have a point of order. Mr. Loretti? Mr. Loretti, for everyone else, said that uh, he believes that Mr. Klein raised a scope question. That's right. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. If you look at the, the language in the warrant, it does not speak about side yards at all. It talks about minimum street yards, and street yards are not side yards. So I don't see how the ARB can be putting forward a warrant article to amend or add to a definition with language that regards um, side yards. Okay. Can we bring up uh, the, uh, the, the warrant? It, actually, it's at the top of the, it should be at the top of the page, right? The, the warrant article text. All the way to the top. Yeah, so warrant article text. To see if the town will vote to amend section 5.3.8, corner lots and through lots to amend the requirement for corner lots in all business districts, which requires the minimum street yard to be equal to the required front yard depth or take any action related thereto. Um, does someone from the ARB wish to make a comment about this question of scope? And to be clear, this is, so if I understand you, Mr. Lawyer, you're not just saying that there was, you weren't calling scope on what Mr. Klein was saying. You're saying that he raised an issue that you're, you're questioning whether the main motion remains within the scope of the article text, correct? Okay, Mr. Benson? Yes, Eugene Benson, uh, Redevelopment Board. I would say it is, it is within the scope because if you look at what it says, depth for its front and side yard as required by the front and side yard setback requirements in the other district because buildings on Mass Ave may have front or side yards depending upon which way they face and therefore it makes a difference what goes on uh, down the street and how that applies. So this minimum street yards has to be both front yard depths if it's a side yard, but also front yard depths if it's a front of the building. So if a building's on Mass Ave and a side street, but most of it is facing 
the side street, so the side street is a front yard, then that applies. So if this, therefore, I think it is within scope. Okay, it is. Uh, uh, Mr. Cunningham, do you, do you have any legal opinion you wanted to share? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Cunningham, Acting Town Council. In just reviewing the particular provision of the zoning bylaws that the Warren article seeks to amend, it does mention street yards in 5.3.8. Uh, so to the extent that there's a scope issue, which the moderator will determine, it does appear that that notice was provided to the body. Great, thank you. So based on the feedback from Mr. Loretti, Mr. Benson, and Mr. Cunningham, it is my determination that the main motion, the recommended vote from the ARB is within scope, and we will proceed with that. Thank you. Let's see. Did we, I think we were just about to take Mr. Gast, is that right? From the satellite room? Oh, he terminated debate, yes. And, uh, all right, so let's rewind here. So, but we did not yet vote on terminating debate, correct? So, um, so all those in favor of terminating debate uh, on all matters under Article 9, say yes. Yes. All those opposed to terminating debate, say no. No. That is a two-thirds vote, and debate is terminated. So let us now move to uh, a vote on the main motion. And before we, bring, before we open voting, let me just uh, run through what we're voting on. This is a two-thirds vote, and you can uh, vote yes if you wish to accept the, the a Let's switch over to, the, uh, to the, the vote language. Thank you. And vote yes if you wish to accept the ARB's recommended vote to add text to item A of section 5.3.8 of the zoning bylaw, which is the section titled corner lots and through lots, specifically adding the text that you can see here on the display, except in the business districts, a corner lot shall have the minimum street yards with depth for its front and side yard as required by the front yard and side yard setback requirements as applicable for the district in which it is located. That is the entirety of the main motion. So let's now open voting on Article 9, main motion, uh, corner lot requirements. So if you wish to accept those changes to the zoning bylaw, section 5.3.8, vote one for yes, two for no if you want to keep the zoning bylaw intact, and three to abstain. Okay, voting is closed. And it passes, uh, 150 in the affirmative, 49 in the negative. Um, wow, that's, uh, is that really close? No, it's not really close. Um, so we will now go to Article 10. Uh, Mr. Revlack? Uh, Mr. Slichman? We have a second to a point of order. That's not a, that's not a thing. Um, Mr. Moderator, yeah. point of order. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9. We have only five articles plus Article 12 before us. Uh, I would wonder if uh, the moderator or anyone else who could uh, advance this question uh, determine whether or not it makes sense for us to come in on Thursday for five articles, seeing as we have defined Monday night as the Article 12 night. Um, that is, a, I think, a fair point. Let's see, so just looking at what we have ahead of us, uh, we still have 10 and 11 um, before Article 12. Uh, I do have one amendment in review for Article 11, so there's some business to do there. Um, the, let's see, and looking ahead to the other articles, if we were to, um, hypothetically, just kind of thinking out loud here in front of 300 people, uh, uh, if we were to convene on Thursday to skip past, like, through a series of procedures to skip past Article 12 this Thursday to go ahead to Articles 13 through 15. I don't believe Article 15 is necessarily finalized uh, from the Finance Committee report. Um, let's see. 
13, I believe, is no action currently with no substitutes. 14, uh, yeah, so, yes, point of order. Yes. Yeah, th th yeah, I can repeat the question. The question is, is it, is it possible or likely that if we skip Thursday and just convene next Monday, uh, might that result in, in town meeting running into Halloween, basically the end of the month? Um, it's a, right, I mean, it's, uh, it's all up to you how long we're going to debate. I don't make motions to terminate debate. I don't vote on terminating debate. Um, I just recognize speakers from queues. Um, so in my professional opinion, I'd say that's unlikely. Mr. Jameson, do you have anything to add since we're having this open conversation about scheduling? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12. I would suggest we do Article 10 and come back on Monday. I agree with that. What? What was that? Okay. Um, now, so I think we're going to stick with the original plan. If we have to skip around to skip over, and again, it, it, it's also up to all of you to vote. I, like we take these procedural motions to lay articles on the table, remove them from the table. You vote on that and decide that. But uh, assuming that the meeting was amenable to skipping Article 12. Uh, which was the intention uh, on Thursday if we got that far, and we likely will if we meet Thursday. Um, there's other business that we can do Thursday, and wouldn't it be nice if we got all the other business or as much as we could get done Thursday and then come back Monday? And then, and then we could finish on, on a high note, right? Where <laughs> Article 12, it'll be a lot of passionate debate and we'll resolve it and everyone will walk out arm in arm and it'll be great. <laughs> Mr. Revlack, are you doing anything Thursday? Mm -hmm. I'm all yours, Mr. Moderator. Um, uh, Steve Revlack, uh, Precinct 1, I have a point of order. Um, regard one of the articles, the, I don't recall the number of it specifically, but it, the fossil fuel article, I believe, mm -hmm. has Article 12 as a prerequisite. And I mm. would question whether it would be wise to take that up before taking, what happens during Article 12 will have a dramatic effect on what we do with the, uh, the article that requires Article 12. Thank you. Um, Mr. Helmuth, did, did you want to add anything? Or Mr. Cunningham? It's not yet recognized. We still have two minutes. Come on. We could have gotten through like two articles in all this time, right? <laughs> Do you have anything to? Yeah. Mr. Cunningham? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Cunningham, Acting Town Council. I think Mr. Revelek's point is somewhat valid. I think that Article 14, the MBTA, MBTA communities requires. Um, the fossil fuel, the for us to participate in the fossil fuel program, we're, we're required as a community to do one of three things, one of which would be MBAT communities. The other two options set forth in the statute are not currently options for the town of Arlington. That's, so that's why the point is, is, is appropriate to make. Okay, thank you. So the plan will be, and, and we, we already had the motion by Mr. Helmuth at the beginning of the meeting that if we don't finish the business tonight, or the meeting, which we did not, that we will adjourn until uh, Thursday, uh, October 19th at 8 p.m. We're going to stick with that plan. It may be a short evening if we run out of other business to do aside from Article 12, which we'll still continue, we'll plan to leave for Monday with the meeting's permission. Um, and so that's what we'll do. So you might get an early night on Thursday, but we'll try to get as much business as we could get done in the meantime. So I would now entertain a motion to adjourn. Oh, I'm also, uh, well, first of all, before I, before I accept that, turn in your handsets. And do we have any notices of reconsideration for any of the articles that we voted tonight? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Seeing none, 
Any motions to adjourn? Is that a motion to adjourn? Do we, I heard a motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? Yes. Okay, we are adjourned until Thursday, October 19th at 8 p.m. See you then.